every single moment of every single day. We need more of God. The seniors need Christ. Youth needs Christ. Children in our Sunday school need to be trained in the ways of the Lord because train up a child in the way that he should go and when he's old he'll not depart from it. That is the Word of God. Where am I going to get my values, the Word or the world? God has never, ever once failed us. Help me never to forget all the wonderful things that you've done in my life. Well, good evening, River of Life. How many of you had a great Thanksgiving? How many of you ate too much food? Me too. Uh, Well, I'm so glad that you made it to church this weekend, and we're excited about what God is doing. We've got amazing things coming up in this month, and uh, so we're excited if you will just be a part of all of it. We've uh, We've got some incredible stuff happening, including our kids play that is going to happen in a couple weeks from now. And I just want to tell you right now, I, I challenged them and I said, listen, if you want both gatherings, you guys got to, you got to step up your game. And so they are, they've got some pretty amazing stuff planned. So whether you have kids that are going to be in the play or you don't, you need to be here on that weekend. It's going to be an amazing, amazing time of celebration uh, with our kids. And again, not too many people will, will have a DeLorean hanging above their nativity scene, but we will here at River of Life. <laughs> Um, so, so make sure that you mark your calendar and come out to that in just a couple of weeks. Uh, we are going to conclude our series that we've called Living a, uh, Leaving a Legacy. And uh, today is gonna, this weekend is going to be the last weekend for that. But I just want to encourage you as we, as we talk about these things, and, and, and maybe you need to even go back and watch some of the, the messages from weeks past. But I really believe that God is calling his church to a new season of understanding that he needs us to live a specific way so that we can impact this world and we can make a difference because this world needs the church now more than ever. Amen? Amen. And your children need to see what it is to walk that out. And so Proverbs chapter 10, verse 7 says this, The memory of one who lived with integrity brings joy, but the legacy of a wrongdoer will rot away. The wise at heart will gladly obey direction, but one who fills the air with meaningless talk will fall into ruin. Let's pray. God, in these next few moments as we look at your word, I pray, Father, that you will show us what we need to see. God, we are so grateful because your word does not return void, that Lord, as we dig into it and we spend time in it, it changes us. It does something inside of us. So God, I pray for every person within the sound of my voice. I pray for those who are joining us uh, in Star Valley and those who will join us in Malawi and those who will be participating with us in the jail. God, I just am so grateful because Lord, you continue to open up doors of opportunity. So Lord, as we talk about legacy, I pray that each and every one of us will realize that God, you are calling us to that. You are calling us to leave something behind that is so much bigger than us. So we praise you for that. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So uh, if you've been with us over this series, I I mentioned it a little bit last weekend, but that we've spent some time each weekend looking at different things. And for some of it, it it is geared towards those of you in the room who are parenting. But even if you're not parenting, we are all called as as church family to pour into the next generation. And so so whether you are a parent right now or you're not, I just want to encourage you to understand that. And then there have been some of the weekends where we've just talked about things like last weekend, we spent some time talking about gratitude and living a life where we are thankful. And, and I hope that as you were walking out this last week, that you were reminded of that and that, that it's not just something that was a week long thing for you, but it's something that you will continue to keep at the forefront of your mind. And today I want to talk to you about a legacy of eternity. Um, the world is very now minded. And so it's easy for us to get wrapped up into that mindset. I'm going to live for the here and the now, or maybe you're even li- living for, you know, the next year or the next five years or the next 10 years. But as a church and as people who are followers of Jesus Christ, the here and the now are irrelevant compared to eternity. We are called to live for eternity. This world is not our home. 
This is not where our landing place. This is not the be all and end all. And, and I've told you this before that I think a lot of times what happens is we can get so wrapped up in, in just what this life, what we have in this life and what, what's important in this life. And I've even used this analogy before, but this time I actually wanted to give you a visual of it. So I actually asked a friend of mine, uh, his name is Fred. He was up here uh, leading worship with Seth while the women's retreat was going on. Well, they happened to have the privilege of living in Palm Coast, Florida. And so I said, man, I really would love a visual of this. So I, I, he sent me this picture. It was a, a picture they took of his wife. And it's this, it's this idea of a handful of sand while you're standing on a beach. And I think that for many of us, the way that we live our lives is that we, that we cherish so much this handful when as believers we know that this is just but a, a vapor. It's just a small portion of, of our entirety of our lives. Our life is eternity. As we accept Christ and we walk this faith journey out, we need to understand that it's about the bigger picture. But when we sit here and we think, man, I'm going to fight for this handful when there's a whole beach of sand. Those, those, each pebble in that, in that handful represents in that amount, it's even more than the days of your life. But yet we fight so hard for what that's going to look like when the reality is, is God is calling his church to be eternal minded. And so I want to talk to you a little bit about that today as we, as we look at some scripture. The first thing I want you to understand is that transformation is greater than motivation. So today I want us to look at a person that uh, had a, an interaction with Jesus. And uh, his name is Nicodemus, Nicodemus, and we find him in John chapter 3. And Nicodemus found Jesus to be very motivational. And so he wanted to get to know him. He wanted to spend a little bit of time with him. So uh, Nicodemus goes and, he, and he, he finds himself in Jesus' presence in John chapter 3, verse 2. It says this, There was a man named Nicodemus, a Jewish religion leader, who was a Pharisee. After dark one evening, he came to speak with Jesus. Rabbi, he said, we all know that uh, God has sent you to teach us. Your miraculous signs are evidence that God is with you. So I want to stop there for just a moment in this story because part of what I need you to understand is Nicodemus wanted to, to know more about Jesus. He wanted to meet Jesus, but he does it under the cover of night because he also wanted his day life, the, the life that he'd created for himself during the day to not get interrupted with Jesus. Now, I think that many of us, if we were honest, maybe we're not there now, but maybe we've had a season in our life where we've said, listen, I like Jesus, I'm all for going to church, but I don't really want that to actually interfere with my day-to-day -day life. And that's where Nicodemus is. He comes to Jesus at night because the people that he was spending time with, the people that were important to him, the, the uh, career path that he had, he couldn't go and fall at Jesus' feet. He had, to, he had to do it in secret so that it wouldn't interrupt his day-to-day -day life. He wanted to meet him, but he also didn't want to be seen as some radical, crazy person. And some of us can get sucked into that mindset where we're like, you know what, I like Jesus, but I don't want to change anything. Well, listen to verse three. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean, exclaimed Nicodemus? How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it wants, just as you can hear the wind, but you can't tell where it comes from and where it is going. So you can't explain how people are born of the spirit. How are these things possible, Nicodemus asked. Jesus replied, you are a respected Jewish teacher and yet you don't understand these things. I assure you, uh, I, I assure you, we tell you what we know and have seen and yet you don't believe our testimony. But if you don't believe me and I tell you about earthly things, how can you possibly believe what I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ever gone to heaven and returned, but the Son of Man has come down from heaven. So we're going to skip down a little bit. Verse 16, uh, for this is how God loved the world, that he gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his Son not into the world not to, not to judge the world, 
but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him, but anyone who does not believe in him has already been judged for not believing in God's one and only son. So here's the reality of this conversation with Nicodemus. He comes and he's already impressed with Jesus and he already wants to just know a little bit more about Jesus. But in this moment, something changes for Nicodemus. Nicodemus wanted Jesus to inspire and teach him something, but Jesus wants to turn his world upside down. For many of you, what you need to understand about this faith journey is it's not just something that's motivational or inspirational. Our faith journey needs to be transformational. It needs to change us. It needs to make us into a new creation. Jesus didn't come to be motivational or educational. He came to be transformational. God didn't send his son into the world to act as, to give us motivation. He sent his son to change the world and to change us. Now, here's the thing that you need to understand is that I believe that we live in a time and a season right now where because you can watch a preacher from all over the world like the day after they've preached, you can get online, you'll see them, and there are some preachers that I would say are motivational speakers, and there are some who will call you out on your stuff. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. You can, you can pack a room with motivational speeches, you absolutely can. Everybody wants to hear how, how good life is going to be, how great everything is, how wonderful they are, all of those things. We all want to hear that stuff. But when Jesus spoke, he didn't speak motivationally. He spoke transformationally. Why? Because Jesus' mind is always on eternity. He wants us to change so that we are A, able and ready to go with him, but we also are in a place where we are transforming others, where we are changing other people through through God's word. 1 John 4, 9 says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. That is transformational. It means that we can live only through the acceptance of Jesus Christ. Now, For many of you, maybe you sit in the room today, maybe you've been in the church for a long time and you're like, yeah, I get it. I, I, you know, again, I'm all for going to church. I'm all for even helping out some. I'm all for giving my tithe. All those things are all fine. But maybe your day-to-day life doesn't look any different than your neighbor's day-to-day life. See, if you're just gonna come to church on the weekends to be motivated, God did not come for motivation. He came for transformation right? Jesus, Jesus could have motivated a lot more people if he'd have just said, hey, I'm going to say all the niceties, all the nice things that everybody wants to hear, and I'll attract even more crowds than I have right now. But Jesus spoke truth with love because he knew that we need to understand that where there's things in our lives that need to be broken off, things in our life that need to be changed, that we need to come to a place where, where he speaks that to us and we're able to change and become more eternally minded, What impact does your faith have on your day-to-day life? Does it really impact anything? Does it change anything? Because if it doesn't, then why is that? And maybe as we've even talked over these last few weeks, you've been been challenged a little bit when it comes to even raising your kids. Because if I was to set foot into your home and, and spend some time there for any amount of time, would your kids be seeing a transformed life or would they just be seeing someone that lives like everyone else? God is calling us to look different. Our time here is so short. And so as we think about being eternal minded, we need to realize that that if we're gonna live for the short amount of days that we have here, we're doing it wrong. But if we do everything that we can to try and and transform those around us and and to be transformational in the way that we think. And so another thing that we need to think about is being selfless is greater than selfish. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says this, this means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone and a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to him. So first of all, you want to talk about something to be grateful for. It's this moment of understanding what Christ has done for us. But inside of that, he's also done it for a reason. So that what? So that we can reconcile people to Christ. So we can bring people to Jesus. 
That's our task. It's our job. You may sit in the room and you've accepted Christ and you go, well, I'm not called into the ministry. Actually, you are called into the ministry. Each and every one of us is called into the ministry. Each and every one of us has an assignment. Your assignment is to be the light in a dark world. Your assignment is to make a difference wherever you go. Your assignment is to show Jesus and to reconcile people in your life to Christ. I've said this before too, but for many of you, what you need to understand is there are people in your life that I will never have the opportunity to speak to. There are people in your life that Pastor Angela will never have the opportunity to speak to. But you have the opportunity, you have the stage, you have the ability to speak hope and love into their lives. And so as we begin to understand that God is calling us to be selfless instead of selfish, selfish is I'm going to make do today what makes me better, what makes me feel better, what makes me happy, what, what brings me joy, what makes my bottom line better, all of those things, that's selfish. Selfless says, I'm going to live today to try and reconcile others to Christ. I'm going to live today to change the world. I'm going to live today. Why? Because that's the part that's eternal. That's the part that, as we talk about leaving a legacy, that is a legacy that will go not only beyond you, but it'll go beyond them, and, and, it, and it can carry on for generations. The funny thing is, is, is we don't have to teach selfishness, right? Right? That, that, that comes naturally. Again, if, we were, if I was to send you down right now to our, our uh, you know, preschool classroom, we, won't, we don't have to teach those kids how to say mine, right? They know it. They've figured it out on their own. Your kids, as they get older, unless we are interacting and teaching what it is to be selfless, and that doesn't mean that for them just not to be selfish, but to be selfless means that they're gonna live a life where they see they see you serving. It was cool today. There was a couple of families that were here at the food bank that were, that were serving with some with little kids. And I was watching these little kids hauling boxes of food back and forth. And I thought, this is amazing because this is exactly how we teach. Like there are people in this world who have needs and we have the ability to meet those needs. And so we're going to step into those, into those stories. But we, we have to learn that if we're going to leave a legacy, part of that legacy is for our, our children to understand what it is to live a selfless life, to be people who look out for other people, to be a people that, that aren't just trying to make my own life better, but I'm seeing opportunities to make other people's lives better. And when, we, when they learn that, then all of a sudden things begin to change. The thing that I, I always appreciated about my dad is my dad was always a guy who, who he always saw people in other countries and, and, and wanted to go and make an impact there. And so throughout his whole ministry, he would travel and, and, and planted churches in Romania. And, and, and then towards the end of his life, even as he had retired from ministry, he had, he had done all of, his, all of his time and work in ministry. He stepped down from church. And as he stepped down from church, he said, there's, there's churches and Bible schools to be planted in other countries. And so he, he spent his retirement raising money to go and, and, and build Bible schools and, and churches in Malawi was one of the countries that he did that. And so it was last year in May when I had the opportunity to go and be in Malawi and, and Ted and Ida were there and they said, hey, we want to plant a tree. And I had them put this picture up here. I, I know that if you were here, you saw that, but they planted a mango tree on the grounds of their foundation. And, and the reason that they did that, she said, this is, this is a tree that will bear much fruit. So it will outlive itself, right? It will grow into a full tree. And then the fruit from a, a fruit tree is, is what? Another fruit tree, actually. See, a lot of times we think that the fruit of a mango tree is, or the purpose of a mango tree is mangoes. But the purpose of a mango tree is another tree, Right? And so she said, this one will not only bring a great harvest of mangoes, but it will also be easy for us to make more trees from this tree. See, that's eternity mindset. That's thinking in a way that we are outliving ourselves, that we are, we are, doing, we are doing things that are much bigger than us. The reality is it's super easy to get locked into what can I do today and what's going to make what's going to make my life better today. And, and as I was thinking about this, I was thinking, man, as we look at this story of, of Nicodemus, Nicodemus has come and he's saying, man, I want, 
I want to, uh, I want to be motivated. I want to be educated. And Jesus is saying, listen, you can't have all, you can't have that. What you need is you need your life turned upside down. For many of us, we've gotten to this place where we like being comfortable in church and we like being comfortable in the world and we're fine with that. But things are about to get uncomfortable. This world is getting more and more uncomfortable all the time. And the day will come when we will have to choose. And so my, my, what I implore you to do right now is to choose now, is to say, God, what is it that, how is it that I can live my life in such a way that it's not about me, it's not about what I want, it's not about what I need in this moment, but it's about what you're calling me to. What is the bigger picture in my life? So the next thing is conviction is greater than comfort. And I'm not talking about feeling convicted here. I'm talking about knowing what we believe and then living it. See, there's a difference. Walking in conviction is saying, listen, I, I believe this book. I forgot to bring the book over with me. It's over there. Um, I believe this book. I know that it's true and I'm gonna live it and I'm gonna walk it out. And even in the parts of the book that are inconvenient, even in the parts of the book that are hard for me to wrap my head around, I'm still going to trust and I'm gonna believe and I'm gonna follow. But also inside of that, I'm also going to teach that to my children. I'm gonna teach that to the next generation and I'm gonna show them and we're not gonna compromise it to make it easier for them. That's become a thing, and we all know that to be true, is that we, we dumb it down so that hopefully they'll accept it a little bit better. But what we're doing is we're actually saying, hey, your comfort is more important than our conviction. And that is not what God says. God says conviction over comfort. When you believe something, you pass it on. Some dads spend more time passing on to their kids what sports team they want to be fans of than they do their faith. Some people spend more time passing on little family traditions than they do the truth of God's word. And I, I just want you to understand is that we are called to be vigilant, that we need to be involved, that we need to understand that this, the, the, the gospel is under attack, that, that God's word is constantly being barraged and, and, trying, and, and the world is trying to stop it. But I'm so grateful because we know the end of the book. We know the end of the story. But the reality is, is Jesus, as he, as he gave uh, parable after parable, many of his parables were, were talking about the fact that in the last days, the, the church, there are going to be those who, who think that they know, but they don't know. And that there are those who were believers that are no longer believers. And so we have got to be vigilant. We've got to pay attention. We need to understand that if we're living for our comfort, we're doing it wrong. If we're living through our conviction, then it's only in that that we'll find success. We need to get aggressive spiritually in our homes. We need to aggressively teach our children what's right and what's wrong. Now, I get it. We live in a time right now where it feels like it could go sideways. Your child could go to school and say something that would tick off the, the administration or could make offend some family member or whatever. But at the end of the day, your job is to live for eternity, not for the here and now. Yeah. And if we don't teach our children what's right and what's wrong, they're going to learn what's right and what's wrong from a bad source. And so we have to pay attention we need to wrestle in prayer for our families. What does that mean? Some of us, our prayer life for our family is a little bit more like, God bless my family today, keep them safe, and then we move on. Some of you know what it is to wrestle for your family. Some of you are still wrestling for kids who have walked away from the faith. Pastor Angela knows what it is to wrestle for her family. Jason shared that story about her putting a war room in her house. Maybe, you know, that's not a sweet little, like, oh, it's a cute little, uh, it's a war room. Why? Because you're battling. We're battling for our family. But we've got to start to get aggressive about our faith. It's not a side note. It isn't a hobby. It's the reality of the understanding of we are living today impacting eternity. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14 says this. 
then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. So truth is being drowned out today. And we need to look, as we look at scripture, it says this is coming. The day is coming where people will, will be tossed and turned by every new teaching. There are bad teachings within the church. There are bad teachings in this world. We've gotten to a place where there are things that aren't religion, but that are being treated like religion. And out of that, there is, there is a, a, a generation who's being raised as though everything is good and, and everything is bad at the same time. And it's chaos and it's confusing. And so as we look at this, we need to understand that God is calling his church to realize that the world is gonna try and trick us. The enemy is gonna try and trick us. He's going to even use preachers to try and trick us. But we have to know God's word. We need to realize that if we're going to be a, a body that is eternal minded, that we need to know the truth and we need to understand the truth. We need to teach our children the truth because truth is being drowned out. We must pour truth into our children. I was thinking about that this week and I was thinking about how is it that we can give parents tools today? to be able to understand. And I, I've told you over the last few weekends, one of those things, one of those tools that I want you to take advantage of is church. I want, you to, I want you to bring your kids to church. I want you to get them involved in church. Why? Because all of a sudden now they surround themselves with a community that can come alongside them. People that will, will help them when they're, when they're making decisions to help them make good decisions. And that's all great and that's part of the equation. If you're not already doing that, do it. If your kids aren't going to youth group, get them into youth group. If they're not going to break line, get them into break line or kids church. All of those things are, are supplements, they're, they're helpful. But can I tell you that's not the be all and end all. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expose you to a tool that for those of you who are parents still in the room that I want, you to, I want you to see and I want you to take advantage of. And it is this. It's the kitchen table. The women did a great job decorating this week and then I ruined it with this kitchen table up here. Sorry. I'm sure my wife walked in and was like, we did not put that up there. The kitchen table is an amazing tool. I don't know about you, if you're, if you're like around my age or maybe a little younger and you remember your kitchen table. I remember my kitchen table. We had the, the chairs with the wicker back. You may remember what I'm talking about? Come on, somebody with the wicker back. I think those are back in now. Uh, but uh, kitchen table is an interesting place because it's a place where we would do something crazy. We would sit down and eat dinner as a family. Some of you don't know what that means because you're running everywhere. You don't have time to sit and eat together because you're an Uber driver for your children as they go from place to place. But we would sit down and we would eat most evenings together. And when we'd get done eating dinner together, my dad would pull out the devotional and he would read a devotion. Can I tell you as a kid, I hated it. Absolutely dreaded it. When my dad would forget to bring out the devotional, I was like, sweet. I'm just being real with you. Because I was ready to go do something else. But my dad would pull out a little devotional, kind of similar to one like this. This is the word for today. You can get one of those at the Welcome Center if you need one. Um, but it was just a little thought-provoking thing. And then he would open the scripture and we would read it together. And we would just spend time as a family digging into God's word a little bit, giving us a moment of, hey, you want to sit down and have a meal? Sure. Yeah. All right, come on over. Uh, this is when I told him to come up, so he's good. Um, kitchen table, though, was where we would sit and we'd have conversation as a family. We didn't get so busy that we couldn't do this. The other thing about the kitchen table was it was the place that I would sit and do homework. Many of you, your kids go to their room and they do their homework. Can I tell you, there's something powerful about the kitchen table. It's a place where you can overlook what they're doing. And if at any time in history you needed to look over their shoulder at what they're doing, it's here and now. 
Because there's stuff being taught that you need to know what your kids are learning. You need to be able to speak into, hey, I know that they say that, but that's not actually true. I know they're teaching you this, but that's not what we believe. There's something powerful about this place. It's a place where, in my house right now, it's a place where oftentimes we sit and play games together as a family. Most of the time when we play games, we'll say, put these away. For some of you as parents, I want to challenge you with this. Put these away. This is living for the here and now. I know we feel like, I'm guilty of this too. There's a lot of times when I get onto this thing and I feel like, what am I missing? What's happening in the world that I don't know? I need to know now. But we don't really need to. A lot of our children are begging for our attention. They want you. There was a season, there was a time when one of my sons got into a lot of trouble and he had a phone at the time, he was old enough, and it was right around Christmas, and I've shared this in here before, but it was right around Christmas and he got into a lot of trouble. And so we said, hey, we're gonna make you Amish for all of Christmas. We even called, I called him Jebediah for a while, it was great. But we, we took all this technology away and we said, you can't, you can't, if you, the only time you can watch TV is if you're watching with us. You can't be on your phone, you can't be on your tablet, you can't be on anything. You're gonna just be Amish. I got him a butter churner, he was doing that in the, it was amazing. No. But something incredible happened. He came and he spent tons of time with us. He laughed, he wanted to play games, he wanted to be, all of a sudden we realized there's a pressure that comes with this. There's a generation being raised feeling like they've got to constantly be on. So as parents, can I just challenge you? Set yours down too. Sometimes I'll even watch, we'll, we'll, we'll be with other families or whatever, and, or even with our own family, and we'll be sitting down to watch a family movie. And it's amazing how many people will still just be, they're not even there. You're, you, we're all supposed to just even be watching that screen and that's not enough. So we're gonna all look at our own screens at the same time. Be present. This is an amazing tool. If you're not already eating dinner together as a family, make time to eat dinner together. Talk about the day. Talk about your faith. Talk about what God is doing in your life. Talk about stories of what God's done in your past. Let your children hear those. They need to. They need to understand that this thing is so much bigger than just going to church on the weekend. And for some of you, that's even more than you go to church. It's bigger than that. Let us supplement what you're doing on the weekend. Let us, let our kids program and our Wednesday night program, let us supplement what's already happening in your home. But some of you, 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 you get so busy with everything else and you're fighting to hold on to the grains of sand that you're holding in your hand when the reality is we're living for the beach. We're living for every grain of sand on that beach that you could never count if you ever wanted to. And I don't know about you, but I want my children, when my time comes and goes and I leave this earth, I want them to understand, man, my dad, my grandpa, he lived for eternity. He lived to bring as many people to know Jesus as possible. As you sit around the kitchen table, have conversations about, hey, are you sharing your faith with your friends? Hey, this week when I bring you to youth group, do you have some friends you wanna invite and bring them with you? You can have an eternal impact, not only on your own home, but on other homes as well. And all of a sudden, your mind will begin to change. You'll begin to understand the importance of being someone who lives eternally minded. As we talk about leaving a legacy, that's what it's all about. It's about being a people who understand the vapor of this life, the shortness that we're here for. So what is it that I can do today? What is it that I can do tomorrow? Who is it that I can reach? What is it that I can change? How can I, how can I step into somebody's story and make a difference? 
And for some of you, you come to River and you're, you've been part of us for maybe even a while and you're, you, you clap every time I talk about how many people the food bank fed or that we sent out 140 some Thanksgiving baskets last week or that we're gonna have hundreds of people come in here and receive Christmas presents for their kids who can't afford it and all of that is amazing. What are you doing? How are you impacting eternity? It doesn't have to be that you're, you're starting a ministry at River of Life. It can be a conversation that you're having, an ongoing dialogue with somebody in your life that doesn't know Jesus. Teach your children how to share their faith. Model it. Show them. Show them you unashamed of Jesus Christ. Show them how to stand. Show them how to speak truth even when it's inconvenient. Show them how to live truth even when it's hard. As we wrap this series, I really want to encourage you. If we're gonna leave a legacy, legacy isn't a generation, legacy is eternity. Some of you, you come from a really hard family tree. You come from a family tree of maybe even misfits. Can I tell you how amazing is it that you get the opportunity to redirect, to change everything. Your story is not determined by your past. Your story is determined by leaning into his future. I'm gonna ask everybody in the room if you'll just close your eyes with me in these last few moments. Maybe you're here today and you came to church on this weekend because you were visiting family or somebody invited you and you don't really know where you're at in your faith journey. Maybe you're sitting here today and you don't, maybe you believe that Jesus is real, but you're not really actually following him. But today, maybe you heard something where you feel like, man, I want, I want hope. I want life. I want to not just live for the shortness of this life, but I want to know that that I have an eternity with Christ. If you're here today and you don't have a right relationship with God, the amazing thing about God is he loved you so much that he sent his only son to die on a cross. We're gonna celebrate him coming to earth in just a few weeks as we look at Christmas. The whole purpose for why he came is so he could die on that cross, so that he can bring forgiveness of sins to you and to me. I don't deserve his love. I don't deserve his forgiveness, but he offers it to us freely. And when you say yes to Jesus, what's happening in that moment is your sins are forgiven. You are a new creation, just as Jesus was talking to Nicodemus about you're born of the spirit in that moment. And so today, if, if you don't have a right relationship with God, I just wanna ask the question, no one else is looking around. I just want the opportunity to pray with you before we leave. If you're in Star Valley, if you in this moment, as I'm gonna ask these to, to lift up their head and catch my eye, if you'll just look at Zeb, if that's something that, that you are interested in as well, Pastor Zeb is in your room and he'd be more than happy to lead you through what this looks like. But if you're in this room today and you wanna make your relationship right with God, would you do me a favor and just lift up your, your head and your hand and catch my eye? I just wanna pray with you before we leave today. Is there anybody today that would just say, I want to make my relationship right with God. Okay, man, I see you. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you, guys. Good work. Is there anyone else? Yeah, man, I see you over there. Proud of you. Proud of you guys. I'll take one more moment. Is there anyone else that would just say, Jason, I just want to make my relationship right with God before I leave today. more moment. Today I'm going to lead you in a prayer. Whether you raised your hand or you didn't, I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. It's an opportunity where you're saying yes to Jesus. You're saying, I'm going to follow you. I, I believe in you. I want, I want new life. I need forgiveness of my sin. All of those things. And God is so good because it doesn't matter how messy you are loves you right where you are. 
So I'm going to ask you to repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, thank you that you love me. I thank you that you see me. I thank you that you have plans for me. Today I'm asking you to forgive me of my sin. I'm making a decision to follow you. I trust you. Help me to live my life with eternity in mind. Help me to follow you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you meant it, you've asked for forgiveness of your sins, the Bible says that God takes your sin and he separates it from you. As far as the east is from the west, it's not associated with you anymore. How amazing is that? Would you give those a round of applause who raised their hand and prayed that prayer and meant it? Welcome. Welcome to the family. Today I want to close this out. And I just want, as we're wrapping up this whole series, my hope is that for those of you who are raising kids, that, that you'll have been challenged in some way to be able to say, man, I gotta, I gotta be purposeful in this. It's not something that you're just gonna fall into backwards and it's just gonna happen got to make decisions to do it for some of you you sit in the room and you've been over this last few weeks been praying for your wayward children and I want to I want to close out today with just another prayer that the prodigals will come home and we're just going to believe that 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 we're going to hear testimony after testimony after testimony of that taking place amen but then we're going to have prayer teams up here in just a few moments as we close out in just a little bit more worship I just want to challenge you, whatever it is that, that maybe the Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart, take a few moments tonight and just say, God, will you just, will you just work on me in this area? Will you help me to be the parent I need to be, the grandparent I need to be, the, the friend that I need to be, help me to be the husband or the wife that I need, whatever it is, just help me to be a person with eternity in mind. So God, I'm so thankful because Lord, you love us so much. Father, I pray God that as we lean into you that God you would just show yourself faithful Lord we do take a moment right now and we continue to lift up the prodigals who still need to come home God I know that there are those who are wayward who have who have turned their back on you who are not believing or not following you or pursuing you and I just pray God right now that Lord Jesus even in this next week that there will be people that will come into their lives that will point to you in a new way God, I pray for parents as they pray and they do battle for their children. I pray, God, that they will not lose hope, but they will know that you are good and that you are fully in control. God, we give you all the praise today. In Jesus' name, amen. There will be prayer teams down here if you need prayer. Otherwise, will you just stand as we worship?